the broadcast with the Eric John Faust today, live and direct from the bustling metropolis of Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, with our one stoplight and uh, no gas station. So, welcome and uh, 24 7 World Radio. And uh, we continue to broadcast the truth, at least as we see it, with freedom of preach, which also includes freedom of speech and freedom of teach. And uh, so we are blessed today to have my usual guest every Wednesday night at 6 p.m., the Stephen Drake, as he reviews his book, World Order. I think we're on the fifth broadcast. So, Brother Stephen, welcome to the broadcast tonight. Thank you, Brother Eric. This is actually technically broadcast number six, number seven, if we <laughs> include the faux pas. But, um, yeah, we are moving right along. And... Uh, in the last broadcast, we talked quite extensively about this new normal, uh, they're now calling it. And so what I wanted to do is I actually wanted to begin with a quote uh, by a man named Jacques Attali, um, who uh, the Rare Foundation in March of 2022, and that's R-A-I-R, uh, they uh, gave him the moniker the real globalist mastermind be, behind the Great Reset. And now, uh, what's this man's name, brother? It's Jacques Attali, A T T A L I. He's a Frenchman, um, or I guess you would say a francophone. And um, I just learned that term from a Canadian Quebecan. He's a francophone. I said, "What's that? Sounds like a telephone." <laughs> That's a nice <laughs> word. Francophone it's fun to say. And so. Uh, this the the following quote uh, comes from uh, I believe it you pronounce it Michel Salomon uh, or Michael Salomon and it's Future Life is the title of the book and it's a bunch of interviews with people about the future it's from 1983 and uh, now this gentleman Jacques Attali was the political advisor and former counselor to the president of France and also the first head of the European Bank for Reconstruction. So that's a gentleman we'll be uh, uh, quoting. Um, now, he was educated at the Paris Institute of Political Studies, uh, whose Paris campus is hosted in a former Franciscan uh, monastery. And then their Reims campus is uh, hosted in the College des Jesuits. So it's an obvious Jesuit connection with this man. Yep, and so again, the Rare Foundation in March of 2022 called him the real globalist mastermind behind the Great Reset, and of course, he's just one puppet, but these things certainly give us more clues. Now, this quote, fascinatingly enough, uh, it, it, it ties together the notions of uh, the priesthood, medical inquisition, Louis Pasteur, <laughs> Karl Marx, quarantine, totalitarianism, and the new normal. Um it's really a, a very, I would even say, uh, esoteric quote. There's a lot of really fascinating stuff in here, especially um, in light of uh, my chapter on like the occult meaning of the sick uh, and this this sort of thing. It really sheds even more light on how deep this is. But I think uh, your audience and yourself will, will discern enough of just how over the top this is. Sure. By the so, way, I just, I just discovered that Louis Pasteur was an item Malta. Ah. That he had. Uh, he has a picture of him with the cross of the Knights of Malta. So, I try to get that to you from one of my teachers, advisors. Fascinating. I didn't know from your broadcast that he was a, a Catholic, and that um, um, uh, Bachamp, his uh, contemporary, was a uh, Protestant. Protestant. Um, sir. And and we'll go more into the origins of of germ theory with the uh, Jesuit priest Athanasius Kircher and stuff in, in uh, subsequent broadcasts. But so this quote uh, comes from pages 177 uh, and 180 through 188. Again, there's a lot of abridgments. I emphasize what I think is most germane to, to the whole. And, um, and uh, without further ado, it reads as follows. Illness is possession by the gods. Healing, finally, is expelling the evil. And the evil in this case is the devil. That is the gods. And the principal healer is the priest. There are always two healers on duty, the denouncer of evil and the separator people we will encounter under the guises of physician and surgeon. The denouncer of evil is the priest, and the separator is the practitioner. Then he goes on, once in, in times past, the poor or sick 
persons were designated, good strategy consist, consisted in separating him from others, containing him, not healing him, but destroying him. People were confined in various ways, the quarantine camp, the lazaretto, the hospital, and in England, the workhouse. The poor law and charity were not means of helping people, but means of designating them as such and containing them. Charity was merely a form of denunciation. And then it goes on. The policeman took the place of the priest as therapist. During the entire 19th century, with public hygiene as a new means of control, the new binds of repairs, and the new distinction between doctor and surgeon, the policeman and the priest were replaced by the doctor. Today, that leads to the necessity of monitoring behavior and hence of defending norms of health and activity to which the individual must adhere. Then he goes on, Marx, that's Karl Marx, is a clinician because he designates the illness, the capitalist class, and eliminates it. In a way, he says the same thing as Pasteur. That's Louis Pasteur. Mm -hmm. The dominant social science of the future will be the science of codes and data processing plus genetics. That's social utopianism. It's sometimes dangerous to be utopian. The medications of the future that are tied to behavior control could lead to political difficulties. It might be possible, in fact, to reconcile parliamentary democracy with totalitarianism. For totalitarianism to take hold, we would need only to maintain all the formal rules of parliamentary democracy, but at the same time to generalize the, the use of those drugs. An Orwellian 1984 based on pharmacology that would control behavior. I believe in an implicit totalitarianism with an invisible but decentralized big brother. Those machines that keep watch on our health will enslave us for our good. The evolution of medical practice as regards mental illness will occur in two phases. In the first, we still rely on drugs. In the second, we will begin to rely more on electronic means of treatment. This will lead to what I call the expli explicitation of the normal. That is, the electronic apparatus will make it possible to define the normal with precision and to quantify social behavior, which will then become economically consumable. Medicine reveals to us the evolution of a society that will orient itself toward a decentral to conform as much as possible to social norms is nothing new. Will forced normalization govern all the realms of life, including sexuality, since science now makes possible the almost total disassociation of sexuality from conception? I think that we will go very far in that direction. So, obviously... But I restrained myself and I did not interrupt. You should be proud of me for that. <laughs> hey, bless you, brother. And uh, I, I appreciate you giving me the floor. Sure, that's uh, wonderful. I mean, all, it, it, all those details substantiate everything that we're saying. It, it's more meat on the bones. The Jesuit power, <clears throat> like controlling through what is it, electrical means. Well, sure. Yeah. So you wonder why everybody has a phone. Everybody's got one of these things, these earbuds in their ear. And when I first saw that, I saw it in Star Trek, and I thought, why, wow, that's unbelievable. Now everybody has them. Many people have them. So the only well, thing uh, one, one I do want to mention about this, though, the important comment is that's impossible if people are not, if people are reading the Reformation King James Bible. It's impossible. That hallelujah. Program, that programming does not allow that design to take place. So that's why they had to take it out of the culture taken out of the schools now we got them and so we can brainwash them program them with our educational uh, educators and succeed so they had to get rid of that book amen sharper than a two-edged sword and yet all the all it is is a book with with god's holy word in it very yeah. counterintuitive uh can defeat kingdoms right that's right so what's fascinating so that that quote was from 1983 uh, so we can see that uh, these these plans were in the works for a long time. Now, <clears throat> some of the stuff that he talked about using electronic apparatuses to define the normal <laughs> to which society should should be sustained in terms of mental health, that will become relevant in just uh, probably another 15 minutes here when we get into some of the predictive programming leading up to COVID. Um, uh, in the meantime, uh, what's fascinating, so in May of 2009, 
uh, this same Jacques Attali uh, uh, would uh, write an article in the uh, French news periodical Le Express where he said uh, a major uh, it, it was it was titled a major pandemic would would raise awareness of by move forward out of fear. And he says a major pandemic would raise awareness of the need for altruism. It begins with the following lines. History teaches us that humanity only evolves significantly when it is really afraid. So he, he talks in 1983 about this forced normalization and uh, quarantine camps. And now in 2009, he's talking about, well, if we want to move, move forward towards these goals, a pandemic would be the greatest way to do so. Now, uh, just uh, uh, a couple months prior to that, in March of 2009, during uh, the swine flu, uh, uh, he had stated, uh, he had basically foretold a steady progression towards a new normal even back then. And what he said was, quote, secondly, return to normal, reorganization. No, there won't be a return to normal. <clears throat> like I said, we are going to radically move towards the level of new technology, new power, the top power in the world that knows even more. It will be necessary to be accepted. A general disorder <laughs> on setting up a planetary order with a world government, with some sort of world currency, as we did for Europe, unquote. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Pursuing the Jesuit Order's Council of Trent counter-reformation design, where it fits in perfectly. Now... He had also written in his book, published in 1998, uh, and this was only published in the French, I believe, but it's titled in the English translation, 21st Century Dictionary. Um, uh, he had published this, which comes from pages 117, 267, 280, 282 to 283, and 311. He said, uh, he said uh, epidemics will lead to the following. Planetary containment measures will be taken, which will call into question for a time nomadism and democracy. As in the 15th century, on a national scale, it was from the epidemic that a necessary global police force was born this time. So eventually, a planetary power. The first risk against which we will continue to want to protect ourselves is disease. The prevention will invade our entire existence. Above all, what remains especially important is to invent a republic without territory, without walls. Every person... So, so, sounds, sounds like the Matrix, sounds like uh, uh, that famous 1930s silent movie guy. What was his name? Um, oh, Chapman. Chapman. Haha. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. He says, every person may one day have the right to a decent income paid by the state regardless of any activity. The universal income. <laughs> and then it says, <laughs> it would require a gigantic bureaucracy, both for its collection and for its redistribution. More than half of all workers will no longer be employed. Working from home via telecommunicating, home office, will account for half of all jobs. Now, so when, was this written, when was this written, brother? 1998. <laughs> okay, looking forward 20 years from then. Yeah. Okay. Like... Like Chiniqui said, they, they planned, what did he say, half a century in advance? A century in advance, yep. yeah. Yep. So this is... Uh, Charles Chiniqui, 50 years in the Church of Rome, dear listeners. Go ahead, brother. Now, what's fascinating is he, he makes a comment that will become more apparent in probably a couple broadcasts from now, where he where he talks about um, the, um, uh, the, the epidemic of the 15th century... Uh, 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 giving rise to the necessity of a global police force. Well, when we talk about, uh, there was a Catholic priest, I, I believe his name was Gerolamo Fractoro. He was the one that first came up with the idea that, going back to Atali's quote we opened with, that possession or sickness was the result of possession, a i.e. heresy. And so that all of this is, again, it's very esoteric, uh, and it's basically Catholic dogma. But all guys and dressed up under medical nomenclature, right? Perfect. Yeah, disguise it under medical nomenclature. Very good. And, and that's now, of course, that's of course uh, confessions of a medical heretic by Mendelssohn, made real for today. Absolutely. Which you, which you have quoted in a past broadcast. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now uh, another term that we've discussed uh, is. Uh, 
correlated to the new normal is new world order. Now, in uh, interview number three, we did our broadcast number three. We we discussed, uh, we we quoted several very prominent people to establish that it is no theory. Uh, it is a fact that these men plan on doing this. And then in uh, our second broadcast, um, I, I provided uh, my material uh, on which I came to the conclusion that COVID was an inquisition under a medical pretense. Now, um, I wanted to uh, add a couple more little quotes, tying it back to Rome uh, that I found at this point. And um, one of them is, is a little bit ambiguous i may be reading into it but i came across this and i i thought that this is very apropos uh in any case now this this quote comes from the aquarian conspiracy by marilyn ferguson Mm -hmm. published in 1981 and Mm -hmm. she said the new world is the old transformed (laughs) yeah so the the new world order is just a restoration of the old feudalism dark age as the pope yes Mm -hmm. exactly exactly now Here's another fascinating quote tying all this back to the Jesuits. Now, this um, Eric 77 uh, discovered, and it is a quote from the World War II uh, Brigadier General uh, Herbert Holdridge. Yep. Uh, he, he put out these news notes, and this comes from note number 15, published in April uh, 20th, 1957. And he said, the Jesuit Vatican conspiracy Here is grand conspiracy continued throughout the ages for control over the minds and spirits of free men to soften them up, to make them an easy prey for the other conspiracies, a conspiracy to further the mammonistic secular ambitions of the Jesuits, Vatican, to establish a world theocracy under the Pope, a conspiracy which did not hesitate to inspire Franco to import Arabs from Africa to slaughter devout Roman Catholics in Spain. That's okay. exactly right. By the way, that is covered in Pierre Van Passen's work, Days of Our Years. He gives the whole brutal, bloody uh, event that took place. 40,000 Muslim troopers raping, robbing, and murdering the Spanish people, and many of them Christians, Bible believers. Okay. Actually, I own a copy of that book um, uh, from listening to your broadcast to decide and invest. And I, <laughs> this is kind of transient, but I, I couldn't help but admire the way that the pages are cut and it looks very organic. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, uh, carrying on. So he says, a conspiracy which has declared perpetual war against the principles of liberty written into our charters of liberty. A conspiracy as closely bound to the international cartelists of quote unquote big money as one Siamese twin is bound to the other. Unquote. Great quote. Tell Eric thank you so much. A wonderful quote we can use. Isn't that something? Yeah. I have Holderidge in my um in my um uh, uh, private citizenship class, and I quote several of the things that he has. But I didn't have that one, so I'm going to have to get that because it's just classic. He, well, expo- you know, he exposes the Jesuits five days after they killed Kennedy. November yeah. 22nd, he came out November 27th and said it was the Jesuit Vatican forces that did this, utilizing LBJ. I mean, he was right on, <coughs> pardon me, with everything he said. So Holdridge is a very great man of his day, very ostracized, but very right. Fascinating. Yeah, it almost reminds me this quote um, of uh, uh, Smedley Butler's the "War is a Racket." Did am I mistaken? Did you read that on your broadcast at one point? I did. I read the whole book. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. And I don't know if he ever tied it to Rome. I do have a book titled "The Business Plot." I haven't had a chance to peruse it yet, uh, but it's in my bookcase. Uh, but um, he seemed genuine, as far as I could oh, tell. Oh, he was genuine. You know, he was a Quaker. He was a Quaker. He got two medals of honor. He was the head of the Marine Corps. Um, absolutely honest. And they brought him in to clean up Philadelphia. He said cleaning up Philadelphia was 100 times more difficult than fighting during World War I or in the Philippines. <laughs> no he was kidding. a very, very, uh, very strong man. He exposed the conspiracy to institute a martial law military dictator. And he named John J. Raskob as one of them. In 1933-34, and then all of a sudden, it's just the conspiracy faded away. But Smedley Butler was a was a great man and had lots of courage. 
Amen. Uh, would to God that, that more men would, would rise up and stand for truth, though the heavens fall. Amen. Amen. So, segueing to uh, another thought here, we I now want to switch to this whole concept of predictive programming. Um, one of the, the quotes that we had covered on a former broadcast uh, was uh, David Rockefeller, uh, where he said, we are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. And that was stated in 1994. Well, it turns out that um, the Rockefeller Foundation <laughs> had put out a document in 2010 titled, Scenarios for the Future of Technology and International Development. And one of the one of the scenarios that they discussed in order to bring about a quote world of tighter top down government control and more authoritarian leadership with limited innovation and growing citizen pushback was titled lockstep. And that's a nice military term. There you go. Yep. <laughs> like the Do what you're told in lockstep with what is the commands that are being given. That's right. And that's why FDR like on the whole country in 1933 to a military camp. Everybody was involved in the military camp in which he would give them direction as the commander in chief. So they've already done this lockstep here. It just gets worse and worse every year. Well, and that goes back to also to the that whole notion of uh, the nom de gore, right? Or the name of war where they put your name in all capitals, just like the right. soldier's uniform. That's exactly right. That's why they gave all everybody a nom de guerre as a U.S. citizen. U.S. citizen is an enemy belligerent, and he has a nom de guerre, a name of war. And, and so that's how we're all treated. All our property is enemy property, and we're treated by the government as though we're inferiors and need to be told what to do in wars of the state since, since March 9th, 1933. Yeah. And what a coincidence when you treat people like that. They, they conform to that and become irresponsible and incapable of self-governing. That's right. Instead of revolting back and not putting up with it, they just go along with it. Just like I was in the prothonotary today and I greeted a gentleman in there. He refused to return my greeting. So I greeted him again. He was working in there. He refused to return my greeting. So the lady that was working there, well, Mike feels okay doing it. I said, okay. So I called up Barb. I called up the head of the prothonotary there. And I said, you know what? I was treated despicably today by this man. And I'm going to be filing a formal complaint. I'm going to be sending it certified mail to you. And if he, I'm going to go back in again, I'm going to greet him again. If he does the same thing again, I'm going to do the same thing. We have to decide we're not putting up with tyranny, even if it's mere disrespect. We're not putting up with it. And so it'll slap you in the face every now and then. And I just recommend you take your pen in hand and you do your work with a pen because it's mightier than the sword. But that's right. Amen. And, and fighting and contending like that is good for us men. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be fighters. We have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Hebrews 12, 4, that's what we do. That's what we're supposed to do. It's how we got Western civilization. Right, Amen. Yeah, and I actually, uh, I uh, begin in my introduction quoting uh, uh, the author who had said, uh, the pen is mightier than the sword. Uh, I think it's a, a fantastic, I, I, evidently, uh, based on my research, it was uh, uh the English author Edward Bulwer Lighton. I may be pronouncing that wrong. Yeah, in 1839. I see. I'm not sure, but very good. So, all right. So now I'd like to read a quote <laughs> that will sound eerily familiar, ironically familiar uh, to all of us who have lived through COVID. And so, in 2010, 10 years before COVID, this is what the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, in their waiting for a right major crisis for the nations to accept the New World Order, wrote, and they said this, quote, this is a scenario they came up with, a pandemic that the world had been anticipating for years finally hits, originating from wild geese. The pandemic also had a deadly effect on economies. International mobility of both people and goods screeched to a halt, debilitating industries like tourism and breaking global supply chains. Even locally, normally bustling shops and office buildings sat up empty for months, devoid of both employees and customers. Enforcement of mandatory quarantine for all citizens, as well as its instant and near hermetic sealing of all borders. 
National leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions from the mandatory wearing of face masks to body temperature checks at the entire communal spaces like train stations and supermarkets. Even after the pandemic faded, this more authoritarian control and oversight of citizens and their activities stuck and even intensified. In order to protect themselves from the spread of increasingly global problems from pandemics and transnational terrorism to environmental crises and rising poverty, leaders around the world took a firmer grip on power. Citizens willingly gave up some of their sovereignty and their privacy to more paternalistic states in exchange for greater safety and stability. Citizens were more tolerant and even eager for top-down direction and oversight, and national leaders had more latitude to impose order in the ways that they saw fit. In developed countries, this heightened oversight took many forms. Biometric IDs for all citizens, for example, and tighter regulation of key industries whose stability was deemed vital to national interests, unquote. And that goes from page 18 of that 2010 document. So we see a reoccurring theme here, and... Mm -hmm. And, and, and remember, the, remember, the Jesuits are the great absolutists. And I have in my book uh, a quotation from The Crisis, The Enemies of America Unmasked by uh, Lawrence. And he quotes the Jesuits. And t as they write, the king, I believe, of Portugal, he says, we are the, we are, um, the monarchical absolutists. We absolutely defend abs mo absolute monarchy. And so you translate that, that's absolute dictatorship, absolute monarchy, absolute oligarchy, whatever it is. But absolutism and centralization of power is always the, the are the, always the handmaids of the Jesuit order. And whenever you see something going to that, there are Jesuits involved somewhere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Going back to the, the dark ages, really, and it, which, which really we can say was ultimately a response to the Lord Jesus Christ and and His Church raising up His through this unstoppable power that That's right. you know, a revival of primitive Christianity was the Reformation. Amen. Because Amen. the circulation of the book of the first three centuries of biblical Bible-based Christianity got in circulation once again, and that's what Moral Diabani talks about. He talks about the Reformation. Reformation was just a revival of first-century biblical Christianity. And he's right. Amen, which God in his sovereignty and providence saw too that in spite of all the papacy's efforts to ban and burn and suppress and censor that uh, it, it was yet preserved and though that light was nearly yes. extinguished uh, yes. through centuries of persecution, God used that man, Martin Luther, that little monk, that little powerless man to destroy, to deal a mortal wound to that, that terrible empire. Well, it surely did put a wound to it. It wasn't really mortal, but it put a wound to it and set them back. And you couple Luther with Tyndall, and they were friends. And you couple those two men, one an Englishman, one a German, and now you have a serious problem for the Pope. And God God showed how he could just take two men and a few others and set back the papacy. And you unite them with the government, like Frederick the Elector and some others. And the papacy had a problem now. So it's my prayer the same exact thing would happen, which is one of the purposes of all your broadcasts, that people can see the connection and take these facts that are irrefutable and then begin to turn against the papacy. Brother? Amen. Um, so I have documented in my book over 60 instances of predictive programming of a similar nature to... Uh, what we just read from uh, the Rockefeller Foundation. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna bring out a few of them here. Uh, one of the uh, more prominent ones. Uh, uh, we'll wait until um, we get into chapter three uh, to discuss, and that's titled Event 201. And and I use that as a as a jumping pad to uh, explore who attended and then show how they're all connected to Rome. But for now, we're just gonna do some kind of peripheral happenstance. Uh, uh, things and we're going to start out with some somewhat comical ones. Mm -hmm. um, one of them being uh, <clears throat> on November 20th, 2020, our Jesuit Fordham educated at the time New York Governor Andrew Cuomo was awarded an Emmy, which is an entertainment award, 
for his state COVID-19 briefings. <laughs> Good actor, yeah. We got to imbibe all this fear and terror and all the people listening to this and, oh, what are we going to do? And, of course, there wasn't even an epidemic. So, yeah, it's, it was very good. I like that. It's a great fact there, brother. Was, uh, you got an Emmy for it. Well, and there's there's a clip that I have documented. I can send it to you or any of your listeners where uh, Cuomo is doing one of these briefs and, and he's uh, putting on a show and he's like, where are all the masks? Where are the ventilators? Where's all the PPE? And behind him, it's just stacked with boxes of like ventilators and masks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and of course, we talked about the uh, one of the COVID briefs. I, I can't remember. I think it was the uh, state of Oklahoma was was given by a, a woman wearing a clown outfit. Uh, I think that was last broadcast we mentioned that. Um, mm-hmm. Well, in another ironic twi- twist, uh, uh, we'll let the listeners decide whether this is coincidence or uh, uh, conspiracy. On August 25th of 2021, uh, the White House Press uh, Secretary, Jen Psaki, referred to COVID-19 as a global pandemic. I don't know. Maybe really? It's a slip a of the tongue. Global pandemic? <laughs> Good yeah. for her. Was it, a, was it a slip of the tongue or was... Was it a, uh, you think it's a genuine? Well, I, it could have been Freudian, as they say. Uh, it, it could have been uh, mm-hmm. just a very ironic uh, 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 misspeak. <laughs> but nonetheless. Well, that's uh, what she's probably referring to it in her private conversations with her friends. Yeah, it's a pandemic. And she pooped when she said it on TV. Yeah. Well, I. I wouldn't doubt it. I know one of the things I document in my book is after one of these COVID briefings, well, one of the cameras was left running and you can hear one of the, the guys say to the other, yes. and, and I have their names. She's like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, it's actually the. Yeah. So they yeah. all knew. Of course uh, they did. Yeah. The Plus, joke's well, on us. In the, Fauci in the bleachers at the time with no mask on and he's with some, some of his buddies. You know, it was, he knew it was all a con. <laughs> well, yeah. My favorite thing about Fauci is the fact that during the so-called AIDS uh, epidemic that he was he was going to gay bathhouses as part of his research. You're kidding. <laughs> no, I believe Quite, it. I think I heard that from George. We may uh, want to double check it just to be safe, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure. That he fit right in, too. I'm sure he did. Yeah, yeah I think he had a, <laughs> a good time. <laughs> well, anyways, on, on a more serious note. Um, uh, so carrying on in this kind of odd uh, predictive programming, um, uh, coincidentally, on November 7th, 2019, uh, which I believe was uh, just around this, almost around the exact same time that COVID supposedly first broke out. Uh, at that same time, Bill Gates starred in a documentary titled The Next Pandemic. And one of the things that was depicted in there was the masses wearing face masks. Just like they did, what, in the early 20th century. You mashed them all up during World War I, I believe, 1918, a period of time. So we're going to redo the same thing here. And I think Gates has just come out with a, a confession that it was all a design. No kidding. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. Somebody sent that to me an email. I have to get it to you. Well, that's fascinating. Well, you know, it, it shows their utter brazenness in what they're doing. That you know, we're going to tell you the truth. So, what are you going to do about it, punk? Huh? Well, there's there aren't any attorney generals that are prosecuting, and uh, there aren't any county prosecutors that wouldn't. If we would, we'll just get rid of them. So, they know they're above the law now. Well, and uh, one of the things that I have documented in my book um, uh, is a picture of Bill Gates. Uh, with uh, a Jesuit priest, and uh, I'm going to do the best I can to find that right now uh, while I'm speaking. Uh, was, but it, I ha- was, was it his wife's, what, uncle? No, um, I, I do have a picture of her meeting with the Pope um, uh, in uh, no, from November 19, 2014, and there's a, a couple men in, in black robes there. I don't know if they're Jesuits or not. Um, but well, she and then, was related to a Jesuit, you know. I believe it was her yeah, uncle. Yeah, I think it was her great uncle, and I think her great aunt was a, a nun. And she she talks about in one clip, I did, was, believe it was a TED talk, that she was uh, uh, educated by the Ursuline sisters, I think they're called. Mm-hmm. Um, 
No, so the uh, photo with uh, Bill Gates is with the Jesuit priest Leo J. O'Donovan. Ah, Leo J. O'Donovan. Well, you know, he was the head of Georgetown University for years. He was um, he was he was the one who put Michael Bloomberg in power as mayor of New York City. Leo J. O'Donovan is not only a high fourth degree Jesuit uh, conducted to Fordham, but he's also a Knight of Malta, like Edmund Walsh was, and he is also a high member of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City. So you're talking a man of real power when you're talking Leo J. O'Donovan. Uh, and he also was there at Bill Clinton's uh, inauguration. He hmm. built, I have a picture of Bill Clinton at the, at the uh, tomb of Timothy Healy and Leo J. O'Donovan standing behind him. And Leo J. O'Donovan is also um, there with... Um, with Biden at his inauguration. Fascinating. Well, and I have a, a quote in my book from uh, uh, Bill Clinton, um, uh, and I believe he was uh, Georgetown Jesuit, Georgetown educated, and, and he was speaking at the Vatican on June second, nineteen ninety four, and he talked about how the Catholic Church brought together faith and action, and then he also mentioned how there was a Jesuit priest that was a role model to him, and and he was an example of what it meant to to keep vows that you make. And he said that that's basically what he wanted for all the people of our nation and the people of the world. Who said that? Well, it's a, it's a speech uh, that he made, Bill Clinton made at the, the Vatican on June 2nd, 1994. <laughs> yeah. And he just loved Carol Quigley, his teacher at Georgetown who wrote tragedy and hope. And <clears throat> so Clinton was educated by Jesuits and nurtured by Jesuits, made president by the Jesuits, and he's been, and of course, he's above the law, too. They can't prosecute him for anything, or won't, I should say. Uh, the other thing before uh, departing from uh, uh, Leo J. O'Donovan, he also has connections. I think he's on the board of directors of Fidelis Care, which is a health insurance company, and also Disney. I don't know if he's still on those oh, uh, yes. possession, positions, but he was at one point. Yeah. Joseph O'Hare was another... Uh, contemporary with Leo J. O'Donovan. Joseph O'Hare was the one who made Bloomberg mayor and CFR member and High Knight of Malta as well as um, High Jesuit of Fourth Valley. Between O'Hare and O'Donovan, you have two of the most powerful Jesuits that ever disgraced this country. Hmm, fascinating. Well, uh, carrying on on our predictive programming. All right, so here's another uh, whopper that's hard to believe. On March 28th, 2019, a TV series called Project Runway, specifically season 17, episode 3, uh, and it's like a fashion show. Well, they featured a designer named COVID, spelt with a K, and uh, one of the design elements uh, featured in uh, the the runway model's attire uh, was a face mask, a cloth face mask. And one of the judges says repeatedly, that's sick, that's sick. Mm -hmm. Well, good for him. He wasn't quite bought off yet, huh? <laughs> or, or the whole thing was uh, written by a, a Jesuit script writer, and that's part of the, the whole allegory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, allegory. Very good. Now, another fascinating happenstance is in the year leading up to COVID, with all the extreme losses that came about, a record number of CEOs, namely 1,332, stepped down from among the world's largest corporations, almost as if they knew something. Oh, sure. Hmm. Another coincidence. They, well, that's definitely can't be a coincidence when you have over a thousand of them doing it. So, yep. They yeah. knew something was coming. They don't want to be there holding their bag so they can be blamed. So we'll just resign. Yep. Mm -hmm. Another interesting uh, tidbit on March 20th, 2020, early on in COVID, uh, during one of the U.S. Coronavirus Task Force briefings, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, referred to coronavirus as a, quote, live exercise, unquote, after which you could hear Trump saying in the background, uh, you should have you should have let us know. Yep. Of course, Mike Pompeo wants to come off as a Christian Bible believing man, you know, but uh, he's not Bible believing enough to tell the truth. 
when it comes to this. So well, and as far as I can tell, getting uh, based on my research, a, a lot of these guys that uh, 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 present themselves as conservatives and Bible believers, they they have connections to groups like the Heritage Foundation, and they want to unite church and state, uh, almost similar to what Hitler did. Well, Heritage Foundation was founded by Frank Shakespeare. He was the head of CBS in Night of Malta. He greatly suppressed evidence on the Kennedy assassination. And Frank Shakespeare was is very was very much involved in the Heritage Foundation along with William F. Buckley. So it's high nights of Malta running the Heritage Foundation. And I laugh because uh, because uh, Tucker Carlson quotes talks about the Heritage Foundation as some sort of conservative think tank. Just shows where he's at on the new right. Yeah, they're all all working for Rome, and uh, that's part of the um, the one of the uh, things that I seek to demonstrate in my book is the connection of the Third Reich, it going under down for a greater imposition. That really, you know, the Nazis were not defeated. The uh, Nuremberg trials were a sham, and uh, it was it was actually intended for a a global movement, which is uh, ironic because uh, my my wife had indicated to me today that the calendar said it was VE Day and we, we looked up what it was and it's supposedly Victory of Europe Day of you know the the defeat of you know the Nazis in World War Two and it's like uh, the only victory gained there was yeah victory for Europe, i.e. the the papacy, the city sure. of seven Absolutely. hills. Yep. When I was doing a concrete job in Harrisburg many years ago, went over to a little restaurant right next to the floor we were at poured and there was a large woman there, very attractive blonde haired and I noticed her German accent so I greeted her in a couple of German words that I know and she said where'd you learn that I said I was stationed in Germany for a while and she said uh, yeah and I said um, what do you think about the Nuremberg trials she said they were an utter sham and that's the first time I ever heard that and it made perfect sense later on as I found out that you know Carl Wolf wasn't there, the second to Himmler. Himmler wasn't there. He escaped. They faked his death. Um, of course, Hitler wasn't there. They made his escape with Ron Hansick's work, Hitler's Escape. If you haven't read it, you got to read it. And so they just got the lower level Nazis there. And Goering was there. And they had Kaltebrunner there, who was the head of the SS, because the t- two high leaders, Himmler and Wolf, they made sure they got out of Europe. So it was an absolute scam and blaming low level. Germans and the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust and what they did in Europe and the big guys, the ones at the top got off scot-free. What's his name? Uh, Mueller, oh. Heinrich Mueller, ahead of the Gestapo. They brought him out of there, put him in a CIA. So all the big guys get out and all the little guys get to go to Nuremberg. Or uh, Martin Bormann escaping wearing a Jesuit Cossack to South That's America. Correct. That's exactly what uh, the great Italian correspondent uh, wrote. Uh, in his the Vatican Papers, Nino Labello. Yeah, you know, I believe his uh, son ended up becoming a Jesuit priest. That's Martin Bormann. That's right. Adolf Hitler, Adolf Martin Bormann. He became a Jesuit priest. That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So another oddity, uh, coincidence, if you may, uh, related to COVID. I just love to be a coincidence theorist, don't you? I mean, it's <laughs> it's so <laughs> logical, isn't it? So logical. That's right. Oh, good. Yeah. Go ahead. So. Similar to uh, 9-11, uh, September 11, 2001, that great atrocity happening the day after the U.S. Defense Secretary announced that they were unable to account for $2.3 trillion worth of transactions. Yes. Yeah. I remember that congressional uh, discussion there with that guy. I think he was from Hawaii. And, and, he, and he looks at, uh, what's his name, uh, the head of the Treasury at the time. And he says, you mean you lost it? It's gone? <laughs> And he's got a smile on his face. <laughs> That's what a military government can do under the papal control of the Jesuits. Well, sort of like the NASA telemetry data. Yes. Uh-huh. Vanished. Whoops. Of course, NASA conducts all of its research and all of its whatever it does on the fact that the Earth is a plane. Well, if you look at their logo real closely, there's a serpent's tongue in it. And uh, the word NASA actually bears a similar resemblance to the Hebrew word NASA, which means to deceive. Uh-huh. Uh huh. What is NASA? Not, not what? Oh, not ever a straight never, answer? Yeah, never, never a straight answer. <laughs> never a straight answer, that's right. Of course, yeah. with Werner von Braun there, that Nazi SS guy who helps to build it, he's at Huntsburg, Huntsville, Alabama, too. 
So they they would bring in the SS over here, and the NASA is an extension of the SS, run by the Jesuits. Yeah, yeah. And then later on, he would basically say that traveling to the moon was impossible, and it would require like I think two uh, fuel tanks the size of the Empire State Building. <laughs> Who said that? Oh, Werner von Braun. Is that right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, well, anyways, so mm -hmm. so just as that announcement was made just before the 9/11 so-called terrorist attack. Uh, just a couple months before COVID, the Pentagon announced it could not account for approximately $4.3 trillion of transactions beyond its usual deficits. Hmm. That's what the Pentagon said? Yep. They, they I made bet they an, like that donation. Yeah. <laughs> they can further build their deep underground military bases, their deep undersea naval bases. You know, they continue to perfect that, that awful octopus tarantula. Yep, and I, I have documents somewhere in my book. It, I can't find it at the moment, but the, uh, it talked about how the uh, the Catholic Church had uh, capitalized on all of these uh, uh, breaks that the U.S. government was was offering to businesses affected by COVID. And it, and the the news article said that they made out the great the Catholic Church made out the greatest out of anyone. Um, oh, of course, of course, just like United Way, everything donated to United Way, the papacy gets one third. Oh, United gosh. Communist Way for the Pope. That's what it is. Amen. I can remember getting fired by refusing to give the to the United Way, and I said, "I'm not united. I'm not going to give the United Way." Come on, we're after all unite here. And all well, I'm not doing. Oh it. yeah, we're all in this together, right? All the in this together, like COVID. the communist mentality. That's right. So I actually I found that uh, in my book, by the way. So uh, it, it it said that. Um, and this was originally published by CBS. It said that the uh, Catholic Church reached or even exceeded 3.5 billion in COVID-19 uh, aid funds from the U.S. government, and then it went on to say, making it the biggest winners in the U.S. government's pandemic relief efforts. <laughs> I mean, that right there shows you that the papacy is completely behind it. Because they benefit most of all. Remember the old little phrase for people who are studying history. The classic phrase is who benefits. Qui bono. You see, yeah, who, who, what, qui bono. And so yeah. therefore, who benefits will lead you right to who did it. Mm -hmm. And this is a classic illustration of that. Vatican gets three billion. You know, uh, three that reached or even exceeded three point five billion in COVID nineteen aid funds from the U.S. government. <laughs> Unbelievable. Now, I believe um, somebody had, uh, I believe it was my fellow researcher, Nick, he found that that was like almost the exact amount that uh, the Catholic Church had paid out in uh, uh, convicted uh, pedophiles. Oh, yes, cases. makes perfect sense. How much they would pay out in the pedophile scandal so they didn't lose a penny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they basically took it from the American taxpayer. Yes, take it from the American taxpayer. Yeah. God deliver us from the income tax for those of us in the private sector. It's easily done. And... Oh, well, go ahead. So in another coincidence, in September of 2019, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board uh, released a report titled A World at Risk, which depicted on the front cover an image of a coronavirus, a so-called molecule, and people wearing face masks. And that stressed the need to be prepared for an outbreak. And it outlined seven urgent actions to prepare the world for health emergencies by September of 2020. And you know, it's so stupid. If there's really a virus floating around, which I deny, the virus is much smaller than any of the masks. Yeah. The openings, the intricate little tiny openings of the mask, it can go right through it. So putting a a mask on to stop a virus from coming in is ridiculous. Silly. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So now for those out there who may identify as conservatives and may see Trump as a, uh, as a savior of sorts, uh, it turns out in March of 2019, again, leading right into the COVID-19 scam, uh, the Trump administration shut down the vaccine safety office. The Trump administration shut down the vaccine safety office. That's right. I well, have that documented from the New York Times. Well, so therefore, he was facilitating a successful COVID, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that a logical yeah. conclusion of that? 
Yep, yep. And similarly, in October of 2019, just a couple months before COVID supposedly broke out, the Trump administration held a training simulation called Crimson Contagion regarding a hypothetical pandemic originating in China that predicted with remarkable accuracy, according to this Business Insider uh, article, quote, some of the exact same scenarios appearing now, that's during COVID, including delays and inconsistencies at the state and local levels over school closures and mandates that most people work from home and practice social distancing and systemic problems in manufacturing, unquote. Wonderful. Well, you know, that's all the more reason for alpha males that are godly and know the Lord to advocate declaration of independence in your state, or and if the state won't do it, if the Jesuits have such a death grip on the state, they advocate it in your county because the county can declare its independence too, just like Mecklenburg County did in 1775 in North Carolina. We just got to cut away from all this. It's just a, just debilitating us, keeping us from fulfilling the Lord's will for our lives. So be not a taker of other, partaker of other men's sins. And that goes into the political arena too. So now I don't want to identify with this emergency war powers military government. I want to cut away from it and have a limited little republic based on the Bible like we once had. All right. So um, now getting back to the uh, uh, that we, we had started with some quotes about uh, electronic means of control and um, uh, of behavior, including directly mental health, as they call it. Well, uh, I have a few predictive programming uh, instances that, well, foretold that this would happen, um, and, and also toxic vaccines in general, one of being our favorite uh, uh, purveyor of, of predictive programming, The Simpsons. Well, it turns out between two episodes, uh, uh, season 22 and season 15, uh, uh, they, they featured um, a secret conclave of America's media empire creating the next phony crisis to put Americans back where they belong. And they decided upon a public health scare, a disease from which no one is immune. And they stage an epidemic in which, which in this case they blame on cats. And then toxic vaccines are actually mandated in order to create the deaths they needed to make the pandemic seem real. And between these episodes is even featured a brochure that's shown titled Death Prick. A Parent's Guide to Shots Gone Wrong. And then when vaccine injuries ultimately transpire, legal immunity is granted for the criminal yep. medical professionals. That's right. And the pharmaceutical boys. And yep. and in this episode, or in these episodes, the victims of the vaccine get prosecuted under a government knows best act. Wow. Yeah, punish the victim and let the perpetrator go free. Sounds like the justice system we have today here. Or injustice system. Sounds like the Inquisition, too, right? Total Inquisition. See, the Inquisition, remember, if you read H.C. Leah's work, The History of the Inquisition, two volumes, Henry C. Leah, he has a, there, was a, there was a museum or a library down in Philadelphia named the H.C. Leah Library. And uh, he tells you that it was international. This spanned into the Far East. It, was, it went into Goa. And other places like that into India and into South America. I mean, this was in, the Inquisition was the papacy's international intelligence community to round up heretics and liberals while at the same time to facilitate absolute rule in any country because the kings were deathly afraid of the inquisitors. And so yep. it's the same thing we have now. Yep, and it goes back to that uh, quote from Atali at the beginning where he talked about the epidemics of the 15th century giving rise to the global police force, which I maintain even then they knew was a pretense, which I think will demonstrate even more succinctly as we uh, in the subsequent broadcast. Sure. Um, so now getting into the, the foretelling of nanotechnology to control people, uh, in 2007, there was a film titled Vexile. Well, that's it. Pardon me. Bill Gates admits there was nano in the in the injections. That's what he admitted to. Oh, okay. I, I have a fair amount of that, uh, I believe, documented in my book from like uh, medical journals and other stuff. Okay. Um, 
So in 2007, there was a film titled Vexile, which depicted a government instituting isolation policies uh, before the general public had time to react in response to a mass epidemic, so-called, which in actuality was a complete government fabrication. And the purpose of the ruse was, in this case, to introduce gene therapy type nanotechnology uh, through vaccines mandated under the guise of being for the protection, but were actually to c gain complete control over people. And so we can completely feminize and neutralize any manhood <coughs> that would stand up to this uh, papal political tyranny. That makes perfect sense. Well, and I have some really interesting stuff that we'll get into. I believe it's um, uh, chapter 13 or 14 here when we get really focused on the vaccine where they actually wanted to remove the so-called God gene, uh, people's ability to communicate with the Most High through what they believed and through their testing uh, uh, was uh, part of the brain uh, act triggered by the VMAT uh, gene, I believe it's called, and they call it the God gene, and they were actually trying. So, and it goes back to this whole idea of counter-reformation, wanting to destroy God's people. Or keeping uh, men from calling on the Lord, you yeah. know? I mean, yeah. I believe it's a spiritual matter. I don't think it's actually no. physical. Or no, no, no. But, but, but uh, the wicked. Yeah. Yeah, but just to keep men from calling on the name of the Lord because they think they can have some sort of man-made solution to their problem. Yeah. So, in other predictive programming, in 2005, there was a PlayStation 2 video game called Area 51, which depicted a quote-unquote Luciferian conspiracy in which a doctor, in order to become, quote, the linchpin for a new world order, unquote, must manufacture a pandemic by working in concert with the CDC and the World Health Organization. And the, in this game, it requires um, a bioweapon from engineering uh, both the population and, and the pathogen itself. And chips, computer chips, are implanted into, quote, majority of the population, unquote, under the guise of vaccination in order to track, monitor, and control uh -huh. them. That makes perfect sense. And, you know, Megaly, uh, the Bavarian Roman Catholic... Uh, SS officer Mengele was secreted out of Europe through the Vatican rat line, overseen by Alois Hudal, and he's known as Dr. Green at Area 51. And he continued what he was doing in his pathological studies at Auschwitz. He continued there at Area 51 as Dr. Green, and so you know they were they were creating something diabolical there. When I have a I have an interesting book by Eric O'Ryan. I, I don't know how. I haven't really had time to peruse it, but it's called The Bush Connection. And he shows pictures in it. And again, it could be uh, spurious. I don't know. But he shows pictures of all these men, including Hitler, supposedly in America and uh, have, having undergone facial reconstruction surgery. Um, so that's that's out there. You can find it on Amazon. Um, again, I don't know. It's subjective. It's hard to tell. He claimed that uh, his girlfriend's father, I believe it was, uh, Otto Scorzani. Oh, yes. Supp supposedly he did a reveal all uh, before his death. That's the... Yes. The, the, yes, I, yeah, I, yeah, the guy that did that, his name was Eric... Uh, forget his last name. Orion. Oh, Eric Orion, okay. And no doubt Hitler escaped Germany because Hansik's work proves it. And I have another work where this American private in Bavaria... Saw Hitler in the back car, back seat of the car, talking to some rich Bavarian who called him Adolf. So no doubt he escaped. No doubt he went to South America. No doubt he probably had some plastic surgery. But he dies in, I forget what year, and I think it's like 1993 or something like that. And there's and he's known as Father Kresge. And <laughs> there were 2,000 people at his funeral. Sean David Morton brought this out many years ago. I thought that was a very intriguing fact he had. Of course, he was an well, animal, but go ahead. And later on uh, in, sub in the subsequent broadcast, we'll detail how it might be possible that uh, Jim Jones actually met met up with Mangala when he was in Brazil. And uh, <clears throat> this will well, this is one will really elucidate the direct uh, connections between Jonestown and what occurred there and what's happening now and the Nazi Third Reich. Uh, again, there's five chapters in my book on Jonestown. I, I just found that it was so intrinsically related, and this didn't. I uh, this was from an epiphany uh, when, in I think my second or third year working on the book, second year, and all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, that incident of supposed mass suicide that took place back in the 70s. I, I, there's got to be a connection there. I just started researching it, 
And I, when I, the, I researched it for months, and I was floored what I discovered. Well, Alberto um, Rivera said that Jim Jones escaped to Elat in southern Israel. Mm. And so Jim Jones was absolutely a Jesuit. He was tied to the Jesuits at the University of San Francisco. But that Rivera says he escaped to Elat, be, being protected by the Pope's Masonic Jewish labor Zionist government of Israel, working for the Pope and not for the Jewish people who live there. That yeah, was, that's exactly right. So now, all right, um, we're, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour here. I just have a few more items. It'll probably take me no more than 10 minutes. Just take uh, your time, brother. I'm, in, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I'm sure the listeners are too. Amen. I appreciate that. I'm enjoying it myself. So continuing on uh, this theme of uh, predictive programming, particularly related to uh, uh, nanotechnology and vaccines. Well, it turns out uh, the uh, singer-songwriter Prince... Uh, in 1996, uh, put out a song called New World. And one of the lines uh, in the song is, quote, when you want to find some isolation, but the tracker you got from vaccination, you'll never walk alone. They're always listening, especially on the phone. How are we going to make it in this brave new world? Unquote. Really? What yeah. song is that? It's called New World. And uh, he released it in 1996, and that's, again, Prince. And there's also a famous uh, clip of him talking about the chemtrails uh, and cause, chemtrails causing people to fight, he believed, that uh, uh, probably a handful of your listeners will be familiar with. Sure. Well, you know, he was snuffed. Yeah, that's they what I'm thinking. Him. Yeah, just like they killed Jackson, they killed him. They got a little too close to telling the truth, and bye-bye. Now their lives gonna... are full of sin, and that's why they can never resist the papacy and the white power structure. Amen. So they're it's easily only, eliminated. It's <laughs> only by a, a miracle of God that uh, us Davids can go against the Goliath behemoth of the papacy. It's just the spirit of God enabling us to do it, and of course we have to be highly concentrated in living a pure life. And that's right. There's that scripture. It says, uh, when, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Oh, that's right. and of course, there's Psalm 91, too, which I, th I think, you know, it says, he that dwelt in the secret place of the Most High. Yes. And so I think only those that are really walking the walk uh, with, with God uh, can really uh, uh, claim those promises. And, and, you know, unless God has a greater purpose for them to, to undergo suffering, see them fulfilled in their life. Yep. Amen. Amen, now, my brother. Now, I got a couple more um, uh, cases of predictive programming tying it directly to the papacy. This is fascinating. Uh, in 1981, a book titled Millennium Glimpses into the 21st Century by Dijkwald and Villoldo described a, quote, new eco ethic, unquote, getting past, quote, Protestant work ethic, unquote, to have instead a <laughs> quote. I get past working for, for your living and working to eat. Oh, no, we're not going to have any work going on here. So, and by the way, the devil's workshop are idle hands and idle minds. And so I'm sure that's part of why they're doing what they're doing. But go ahead. So fascinatingly enough, they say that we need to get past this quote unquote Protestant work ethic to have instead an essential versus non essential work ethic which we all know those phrases from COVID. And it says that uh, the non-essential workers would be determined by medical experts, quote unquote, to be put on a universal basic income. And it sa it even says it'll be like the middle ages when you were a serf. Right. Of course, we all know when anybody uses the term middle ages, it's the dark ages. There's no such thing as the middle ages. It's the dark ages of the Pope. And it's in between the wonderful first three centuries of the true preaching of the gospel and the Protestant Reformation that revived it. So they might call it the Middle Ages, but always the Dark Ages of the Pope. Amen. I agree. Now, so another fascinating thing, I think we talked about this on the, the very first broadcast that was lost. Um, uh, on March 2nd, 2020, the Vatican opened its secret, previously sealed files on Pope Pius XII for the sco to scholars available to scholars for one week who are trying to find out at just what point during the Nazi Third Reich the, the Pope learned of the atrocities being committed. And then it says, but then COVID broke out and it halted the research. <laughs> what an excuse to stop the exposure. You know, 
I, Hitler used to send a Pius, no, Pius XII used to send Hitler a birthday card every year. That's right. I document that in my book. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Hitler said to Pius, he says, I'm just following the, the doctrine of the Catholic Church. It is followed for the last 1,500 years. Pius no. put Hitler in power. And I believe and, that that comes from uh, uh, Peter de Rosa's Vicars of Christ. Yes. And also you have uh, uh, a woman rising beat by beast by Hunt. And you see Franz von Papen there, the Knight of Malta, Vice Chancellor of the Reich with Hitler. He was, the, the Pope used uh, Van Papen to put Hitler in power. So now, no. to say that Hitler was not controlled by the Pope is a bold-faced lie. It's like that lying Jew, Michael Savage, never proved, never wanted to admit the Pope controlled Hitler. And he also was advocating that Pius XII should be canonized. Yeah, he should get the canon. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we're kissing up to the papacy by all these supposed conservative broadcasters. So, in closing, all right, predictive programming. Well, we we see this all right for COVID. I covered just a handful of them from over sixty. I've documented my book. We saw that they did the same thing with drills and simulations, either just before at the same time as, for instance, uh, the nine eleven terrorist attack. The London uh, 7 7 bombing, the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, the Sandy Hook shooting. So, this is a reoccurring theme they do for all these uh, mass events. So, then it becomes a question of why do they do this? And I maintain there's several. Number one is it's a form of psychological conditioning so that the masses will more readily embrace it as normal because they've been subconsciously the idea introduced. On yep. top of that, it's also a form of black magic and witchcraft. Yep. And on top of that, because these people at the highest levels that are orchestrating all this, they worship Lucifer as the supposed fount of all knowledge and he who gives illumination, blah, blah, blah. But, well, they despise the masses because the masses choose to live in ignorance. So they love in their satanic twisted minds to tell you what they're going to do uh, before they do it, because then they can also say, hey, guess it what? It tells you. We, yeah, told we, we told you what you're going to do. We, we got plausible deniability here. It can't be a conspiracy because we already told you. Yep, and, and I would say that that's the same thing that they do with, um, uh, for instance, like with the, the murdering of the homosexuals with AZT under the yep. pretense of AIDS. It's the Catholic Church. It's the Inquisition. They're saying, hey, you guys are homosexuals. You're living in sin. You get what you deserve. We're going to kill you. When the vast majority of the priests are homosexuals. When I've heard it was exactly there, right. 95% of them are homosexuals. They're going to, just like Hitler, he was some other, what does he do? He kills homosexuals. The SS rounds him up and puts him in the death camps. And it's documented by Kevin Abrams in his book, The Pink Swastika. So he had these notable homosexuals in political power, killing homosexuals. Yep. Yeah, it's just like the, the Pharisees. And I can't remember the particular chapter, but in Matthew, I think like 23 times, Jesus says in a singular chapter, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Yeah. Um, so... I say here, in closing, that these con these conspirators, uh, they are the epitome of pride. And, and like Satan, as it says in Isaiah 14, they want to exalt themselves above the throne of God. And so they have to do these things as a, also a subtle wink and nod to how great and clever they think they are. And to, to close and to demonstrate this, I quote now, from the great book which you offer uh, on your secret, uh, rare books collection as part of Vatican Assassins, The Jesuit Conspiracy, The Secret Plan of the Order by the Abate Leon. Uh, he said of the Jesuits, he said, they have always spoken of themselves in terms of the most unmeasured pride. When their society had reached the 100th year of its existence, they composed a book in its honor. The symbols which decorate the, the front piece of this work sufficiently prove that they esteem even the humblest member of their order as infinitely above the rest of mankind. Right. They call themselves the company of the perfect. That's the, right. The contents of the volume accord with the arrogance of its emblems. <laughs> That's right. The company of the perfect. That's right. Yep. There, there's no secret society military army that's ever been as powerful as they've been and they are satan's right hand to bring about the fulfillment of the mystery of iniquity and that's why since it's a warfare and they're an army they have to be met on the field of battle with the bible believing men and the men of the past were calvinists they were puritans they know how to deal with them 
Amen. Yeah. All right, my brother. Well, is that the conclusion of your presentation for today? That is. Well, I want to say it was thoroughly enjoyable. Thank you for all your work. I know it's really, really hard to get all that together. So pray the Lord will bless you for it, your dear wife. And uh, so if you have any so closing there you cut out remarks, one, brother. pardon? If you want to. Oh, your uh, broadcast cut out there for a moment. Oh, okay. So if you want to have any closing remarks and uh, summation and then your contact information, please give it to us. So my name is Stephen Drake. Uh, I may be reached at sdrake088 at gmail.com. Uh, my book, soon to be published by God's Grace, is titled World Order, Exploring the History and Destiny of Man Through the Lens of COVID-19. And basically today, uh, we primarily went over some of the predictive programming. We, we also talked about this idea of the new normal and how they had been planning it for uh, a number of years, and uh, once again, bringing it all back to the Vatican and showing how COVID is nothing more than a return to the dark ages, ultimately, and it's incumbent upon us men uh, to stand up for the truth, to get right with God, to repent, uh, and um, may the Lord do with what seemeth good to him. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Brother Ray John Phils, 24-7 World Radio, thank you for being on the listening into this broadcast today, and I trust that it was a blessing to you as it was to me. And uh, please uh, pray for us, two minutes a day, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, that the Lord would continue to enable us to bring these kinds of broadcasts that are biblical and historically correct. And uh, please send your donations to rbpbchurch at comcast.net if you want to send a check or for Cash App, E-R-I-C-J-O-N-P-H-E-L-P-S at Cash App or rbpb donate at comcast.net that is rbpb donate comcast.net if you want to get paypal but in conclusion thank you for your gifts thank you for your prayers thank you for your gift dear sister tammy and i am going to continue to have uh, brother Stephen on because you said you really enjoy him in your note that i received today so amen so until the next time we meet we met today here on what may the, the 9th is that what it is brother may the 9th uh, the 8th. The 8th, okay. May the 8th, 2024. So thank you, Brother Steve, for being with us. And we'll meet again next Wednesday at 6 o'clock as the Lord enables us to do so. So until then, Maranatha.